working tonight, tomorrow, Sunday. As Mr. Colwood said, I'm Officer Eric Toto, Principal of County Police Department. My current assignment is in the Forensic Services Section, the Crime Scene Unit. Uh, anybody watch CSI? Yeah. TV show? Thanks. Yeah. Junk. Don't pay attention to it. It's all scripts. Everything's solved in the first 50 minutes. They get an arrest. It's over. My, what I do is, is very <laughs> dirty and nitty gritty and bloody and gory. Do I have anybody here and interested in crime scenes? Yeah? A couple of you? Anybody else? Maybe? Maybe you kind of get an idea after I get done talking to the end of the, the class, maybe you have a little bit more understanding. Uh, talking about my background, you kind of see where I come from. You don't have to come from a science background to do what I am. I've been on this job for 16 years now. 14 years I was in patrol station in the West End, so all this end of the county. And nine of those 14 years I had what was called as a CST, as a crime scene technician. So as a patrol officer wearing a uniform, driving a patrol car, I also had an extra duty of CST. So chances are your house was broken into, burglarized, I'd be the one to come process the scene, looking for fingerprints, looking for any evidence, footwear, handing at that level. Now I'm in the big leagues. Now it's all the death. It's all I see. Dead, I see dead people. That's my job. Last year was a very, very busy year. 22 homicides. Most we ever had in this county. And fortunately, 21 of those 22 cases we solved. Made an arrest. Somebody's sitting in jail right now because of those. So in one case, we didn't get solved. But that's one of the best closure rates anywhere around here. So, so I enjoy what I do. This is why I'm here, hopefully inspiring some of you guys. Some of you, maybe you shook your head, maybe you're interested in crime scene, maybe a little, bit, a little bit more after I get done. Otherwise, the rest of you, obviously, you're trying to learn about criminal justice. That's why you're in this class. There's so many different areas in law enforcement you can be involved in. This happens to be what I love to do, is crime scene work. So that's what I'm going to do. Just talk about what I do, job-wise. See if you guys are interested. I love to ask questions. So those who answer, uh, Correctly, get the first kiss. Oh, oh, whoa! Now I got your attention. And, and guys, feel free to ask questions as I'm talking. I have you for some time, so anytime you have anything pop up, feel free to ask me. Okay. My name is Justin Lee. <laughs> What's that? I said, there's a microphone right there. I see that, it's a very large. So our class objectives, I'm gonna kind of go over Fourth Amendment issues. Anybody know what the Fourth Amendment is? Fourth Amendment? What is it? Boom. So, Fourth Amendment, search and seizure. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Those three components used to document a scene. Three types of photographs used to document a crime scene. Three types of crime scene sketches and their use. And identify proper measurement techniques. Identify the needed direction on a sketch. And demonstrate the proper techniques of documentation, preparing crime scene sketch packaging. Basically, I'm going to tell you everything I do from beginning to end. So if it's still you're still interested by the end of the class, I'll be looking for your application once you're going to college. Um, so, kind of give you an example of how my day starts. So just think, use a hypothetical scenario. So someone calls 911. Call taker answers the phone, they hear a woman scream, yelling for help. Call taker hears a gunshot. Phone goes dead. Call taker tries to call the number back, but nobody's answering. Try to call back, nobody's answering. Meanwhile, call taker sending all this over to the dispatcher. Dispatcher sees, all right, something's unknown trouble, maybe a gunshot, somebody's screaming for help. So patrol, patrol officers, getting the call, running lights and sirens to the house or the location, wherever it's at. 
They get to the scene, start knocking on the door, announcing who they are. Nobody's picking up. Or nobody's answering the door. So they make a decision. No one's answering the door. They have an unknown trouble, possibly a gunshot. So they decide to breach the door. They go in the house. They see a body lying lifeless. They announce who they are, enter the house, start going in, try to check the body, check for pulse, no pulse. They realize there's still maybe more trouble. So they move around the house announcing who they are. They see another body laying in another end of the house. They announce again, come up to the body, check no pulse. So now they have two possibly dead bodies. So they start announcing to their supervisors, hey, we got something going on here. We're going to need some more help. So they call fire and rescue. They confirm we have two dead bodies in the house. They now lock the house down, put crime scene tape all around the house, post an officer out front, taking names, everybody who comes up, post an officer in the back on the sides. Anything you pretty much seen on TV, there's a lot of police presence. That's when I get the phone call. I get a phone call saying we have a case, we need you to go investigate. So I get the call. This is my uniform of the day. So I come in. This can be pretty bloody, dirty, disgusting. So I arrive, I get a big crime scene truck full of gear that we all need, come up to the house. And one of the first things I ask of the detective who meets me there, that's one important question I ask. I want to know if they have any, any chance anybody knows what that is? Take a guess. Suspect? That's not what I'm looking for, but that's going to be in a conversation. There's one thing that I'm really concerned about that allows me to be at this house. Body. Oh, body, but have it. A warrant. Thank you. Search warrant. This is where the Fourth Amendment comes into play. Oh. 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 Good catch. Fourth Amendment, right to search and seizure. I cannot just enter this house, start taking everything I want, and leave there without a search warrant very important that I have a piece of paper. And one of the things I'm going to be talking to is the detectives that I need the search warrant. So they're going to send another detective, they're going to type it up, write it up on a piece of paper, go in front of the magistrate, and they're going to be discussing probable cause. You guys know what probable cause is? What probably caused it? <laughs> <laughs> probable cause and roundabouts, yeah. Uh, just enough evidence based on what a crime has occurred. Has a crime occurred? Well, we have two bodies, and maybe those bodies will have trauma to them. Gunshot wounds, maybe other trauma to it. So we know that crime is committed. Two lifeless bodies, they're pronounced deceased. That's enough probable cause to allow a search warrant to be issued and allow me to go in this house and stay there as long as I need. You guys remember the officer asked when he was killed last year? I was the lead investigator on it. I was there four days. In that scene. We held the house that entire time investigating inside and out. It took that long to make sure we had all the evidence that we needed. We made an arrest, but we wanted to make sure we had everything we needed. Obviously, a high profile case, we had an officer killed. I want to make sure that person who did it spends the rest of his life in jail. All right? So we have the scene, I roll. I find out the detective is getting a search warrant. Once I have it in hand, that's when I start doing my job. And what is my job? Nope. Documenting the scene. Making sure we have everything. Photographs, this is all fourth amendment. Photos, notes, and sketches. Those are the three elements that I'm working on as I'm coming up to work this crime scene. This is pretty cool. This is a not a real human brain. It's a skeleton, a uh, fake one. But last year, last October, I took a buried body class, and the instructor sent a uh, skeleton to the host agency, which was the U.S. Park Police. Asked them to bury this body in the field and give it about six months, so all the grass grows over the body. And so, as a class, we had to go find that gravesite, and then once we found it, we had to document it. So that's what that picture is. Is that class from last year? Very tedious. Those uh, my future crime scene investigators, you gotta have patience. Things don't happen just like that. Not like the TV show CSI. Not everything's done in 50 minutes. It could be several days, weeks, 
working on stuff. There he is again. And this is very tedious to do this. You ever seen that show Gold Rush? They're panning for gold up in Alaska. We're doing the same thing. Take an inch of dirt, a layer off, put it in buckets, put those buckets on sifters, shaking those sifters, trying to find any evidence. We don't know what we're looking for, but we're going to try to find anything that might be relevant. Maybe there might be a little piece of paper or hard piece of plastic, maybe it has a fingerprint on it, that we find from doing that, that leads to a suspect. And you guys ever seen this before, the forensic linkage triangle? It's a good way to represent how I do. Evidence links everything together, a victim, a suspect, to the crime scene. Anytime you can break that triangle, you can lose out on the case. So it's very important that evidence ties everything together. Maybe it could be blood, latent print. Does anybody know what a latent print is? Isn't it just a fingerprint on the surface? Fingerprint. Latent is just a fancy term for court. You're going to have a lot of kids. Remember, Mr. Colgan said, throw this away. You know what he's saying? Holding groups. It's a fancy term for fingerprints collected. When somebody leaves a fingerprint on a scene, one of the things eventually I'm looking for is that fingerprint. And as I collect it, it's called a latent. But once I collect it, I can send it to our fingerprint unit. They can look at that fingerprint, compare it. The NCIC, VSIN, this is all the regional databases that they can look into. So chances are if someone was arrested or just had their fingerprint taken, you can get hit off. Fingerprints are very important in our job. We find a lot, so a lot of cases from them. So, notes, photographs, and sketches. Anybody here in photography? Yeah. It's very important what we do. And those of you who are interested in this job, keep working with your photography. It's not the same as taking glamour shots, but. Crime scene photography is very, very important. You gotta understand how it works with camera. You can't just throw it on automatic thinking you're gonna take a good shot. You can't use a camera off your cell phone, that's not gonna cut it. You gotta use a good camera to take good pictures. That very first slide I showed they had a blue handprint. You guys remember that? That was actually special photography uh, technique. And that blue fingerprint or handprint was a uh, a uh, bloody handprint that we use blue star to illuminate make it start bright blue took a photograph of it of course we're going to swab the blood but that was from a training class but it was uh, pretty cool we can't just use an automatic because it's in a dark setting so photography is very important everything we do is photographed from the beginning we do everything systematic systematic approach as soon as we roll to the scene we start taking photographs the first thing we do because once there, imagine the chaos the scene I told you about. You've got two bodies inside, patrol officers everywhere. Fire and rescue gets called. They come into that house. They're feeling, make sure that there's, uh, everybody is deceased. They're going to announce it. But they're also disturbing my crime scene. So I'm going to take pictures as quick as I can to make sure I'm documenting that scene. Because anybody heard of low cards theory? Yes. What is yeah. it? Every person, like every suspect needs a bit of evidence. Right. Exactly. Any, anytime a suspect enters a scene, they're bringing in evidence. And every time that suspect leaves, they're taking evidence with them. But it goes with everybody who comes into a scene, being in fire and rescue, or other patrol officers, they're also bringing in evidence that shouldn't be there. So I have to make sure I have the scene very secure and I'm taking photographs. Because maybe I'm looking for footwear on the floor. <clears throat> I can get it from linoleum, I can get it from carpet. I can get it from various different sources, but if somebody's walking around on top of my footwear, I'm gonna lose that evidence. So photography is very important. And this, different kinds, obviously, overall. Again, from standing back, mid-range, and then close-ups. And overall, it's just that. Imagine, has anybody ever seen those pictures? Real close up. 
you have to guess what it is, right? You don't want that in the crime scene photography. You don't have to guess. Somebody who's, if you guys don't know anything about a case and I show you a picture, you shouldn't be guessing what it is. So we start with overall, show where this crime occurred. So this house where you had two bodies that were deceased, I'm gonna take a picture of the whole house so we know exactly where it took place. And all my pictures are gonna be from there. Getting inside, showing where all everything took place. And this is a good example of an interior overall. This actual crime scene from years ago. So imagine just coming into a room, you stand at one corners. And we do everything systematically, so we do it every right every single time. So you come in, taking a picture from a one angle, move it to each corner, taking photographs from each and every corner. So you can see what the whole house looks like. And this example, this is actually a crime scene a photo from a long time ago. The chair is where our body was. You see the blood. Ew. Was on, on the chair. Here's another angle. See right there. So we want to. That's what the whole point of this photograph is: showing where this chair was, where it's located within that room. Next year overall, standing from a distance behind. So you again. It's kind of hard to see in here, but there's two pieces of evidence. This is our actual criminal justice academy out in Oaksville. This is the mock-up photos. But the whole idea is you're standing away from outside, there's evidence, and you want to show exactly where it is within your, uh, your picture. So we're going to do a mid-range. Same photograph, now we're just getting a little bit closer. You can see there's a hammer, there's a boot. And you can see an adjacent to where that corner of the wall is. That corner is never going to disappear. It's always going to be there. So if we want to ever place those items back based off our photography the picture, we know where they were. Of course, we're going to measure it before we get to it. And the close-ups. Bloody hammer. This is an actual crime scene uh, photograph again. Not from our case, from another jurisdiction. But if we find a piece of evidence, we're going to take a photograph of it. We're going to use a scale, show what size it is, how big a hammer it is, and we're also going to label on the scale what item number it is, case number. And the important thing is, we don't, as we investigate, we're looking at it and we find evidence, we want to make sure it's well documented. And anything that goes to court, we don't want any defense attorneys to say that we suggest that we planted evidence. We're going to have plenty of photographs showing it was in that scene before we collect it. In our notes. Those of you who are interested in crime scene work, you're going to write in a lot of reports. And one of my last reports was 10 pages. Front and back. Detail everything I did. Everything. So you, you don't like to write, unfortunately, it's part of my job I got to do. Because I'm taking a lot of notes of everything I'm involved with. Documenting conditions, the lighting, the weather. Everyone is present, all your senses, your senses are very important. So you can only imagine what dead bodies smell like. Even blood, there's a lot of blood in the scene, you can smell that. Maybe somebody in this particular scenario I told you guys, if somebody fired two gunshots, you can smell gunpowder. All those senses I'm going to write about in my report, take notes of it. But there's been some cases where, and I'm actually, uh, yeah, I'll show some real photographs from crime scene I had a few years ago where a gentleman was deceased in his house for over a month and decomposed for that whole month. It was one of the hottest summers we've had on record. It was like 100 degrees, 15 days of the month of July when he was dead. Didn't have his air conditioning on. So if you're, you can handle that crime scene wise, you can handle anything. Because that's the nasty part. You know, that's the... So anything we see or do, we're going to take uh, notes on. So, again, important things that I do is taking notes, taking photographs, documenting everything. It's important that I, if I find any evidence, and I like to use the example of puzzles, putting all the jigsaw puzzles together. Anybody do that here? 
know what? Sometimes, just imagine the more pieces you have, the more difficult it is to put that puzzle together, right? You got 500 pieces and you're trying to figure out how to put that together. That's what I'm kind of doing. It's very easy to take the whole house and say the whole house is evidence, but not everything is evidence. So I'm walking in there and I got to figure out what's important and what's not. So it's like that jigsaw puzzle. Put one little piece together and then start with the edges, then work your way in. I mean, that's how what we do. Very tedious, it can be difficult. I've had some cases where I've had 200 pieces of evidence that was collected. And then it took me the next several months looking at each piece of evidence I collected, looking for fingerprints, do I have any evidence, DNA, submitting all this stuff to the lab. So it can be very tedious. Yeah, notes. <coughs> and sketching. Sketching is very important because as photographs, you know, it's taken from our perspective besides you're standing here. But you don't always get to see the spatial relationship between items of evidence. You can just imagine if you're in here, all these desks are cluttering up your picture. So one of the reasons why we do sketches, and if you know, as you guys always leave out each and every classroom, there's that map overhead, bird's eye view of the school, exit routes. That's what our sketches look like. And the reason is we're going to put in there items of evidence that we collect so we know exactly where it was within that room or house or apartment or wherever it was. There's always the supervisors are like, this you guys can see that. Right? Same as hopscotch. So the purpose of it is, one, again, to record the scene. It's going to illustrate the direction and dimensions of everything. We do, when we sketch a house or apartment or whatever, we're actually going to measure everything in that room. So if this room was a crime scene, I'm going to actually measure the dimensions and I'm going to measure everything within it. And three types of sketches are rough, intermediate, and final, as we used to report. And a rough sketch is uh, also, it helps incorporate with overall photographs. Uh, and all our scales, or all our uh, sketches aren't to scale, they do uh, the same measurements and they're very detailed. Not everybody's artists to do what I do, so sometimes people like to trace. Right? Here's an example of a rough sketch. All this is detail work, measurements, items of evidence, where they're located within that room where we collected it. Again, it just shows with our pictures and our notes and our sketches exactly what we collected and where it was. And if we ever had to reconstruct a room, we could. And last year I had a case where it was a double uh, homicide where it was involved in an arson case. Where it was two guys, two uh, roommates were fighting each other. Both of them were drunk. One guy got too mad. He went outside, the other guy passed out on the couch and got, the other guy got a can of fuel. Started dousing the living room where this guy was sleeping. Now the guy who was drunk doing this was so drunk he didn't realize he was splashing gasoline on his legs. So then he took out a lighter, threw it on the ground, <laughs> whole living room went up, including this guy's legs. And then he realized that he ran out of the house, ran out the back way, and actually leaving his socks stuck to the, the back patio, which I ended up collecting. He ended up running off, patrol actually saw him, this was the middle of the night. Saw this guy running down the road, no shoes on, just shorts. And he could tell there was something wrong with his legs because they were real bright red because of the fire. Catching up to him, caught him, detained him. The patrol officer realized there was also an arson fire that happened the fire rescue was going to. And he saw this guy, he thought they brought him back to the scene. So long story short, he ended up killing two people in that house with that fire, including that guy sleeping on the couch. He had gasoline all over him. So the cool thing with that is ATF was also assigned to that along with me, and we measured everything in that house. We actually recreated 
the whole first floor in their lab in, um, in Maryland. And we actually redid the whole fire just to show exactly how the point of origin was. So never know when you might have to recreate anything. So our notes and the photographs and everything we did, we was able to recreate that whole first uh, floor of the house. And a finished sketch. There's an example of a finished sketch. Much cleaner. You can actually see it looks like almost like the evacuation plan. Overhead, you can see where all the items and evidence were collected. This is just a mock-up final sketch. <clears throat> and this is done on a computer program. It's like a CAD program. All you gotta do is be able to draw straight lines. It does everything for you. And all these, it's an actual architectural program so you can have sinks and couches. So if you're not an artist, you don't have to be. Computer will do it for you. These are things we always have to put in there. Indicate north, the legend, and key symbols. It's whoever looks at this, and juries love to look at overhead diagrams. They see where everything took place. They want to see the scene. And like I said, if there's items evidence in this room, or in some room, or this, like the scenario I gave, maybe there's a gun laying on the ground, we're going to measure everything. Measure the whole room. And then we're going to measure it to where that gun is. And two ways we do that is triangulation and baseline. This is a good example of triangulation. It's using two fixed points, like a corner, like a doorway, or anything that won't move. It's permanent. We're going to measure that distance between two. We're going to measure to the item of evidence. And the other way we do it is baseline. Same two points, but then we use a perpendicular line. We make sure it's 90 degrees. And we can measure that same item. And again, we just know exactly where it was. An important thing of it is so if we had to recreate it. Now this is really cool. This is a Leica P43D scanner. What this thing is, I set it up on a tripod in a room, and I think scans. It scans the whole room. 360 degrees on the uh, horizontal, 270 or 270 yeah, degrees on the bird. So the thing that this will do is, as this thing's measuring, it's sending out a laser beam, and it's picking up roughly 12 million points of reference every time that thing gets an item. So what it does is how you saw how I did that sketch and draw it through the computer. It does it for me. That piece of equipment. We only have one, and we share it with our crash guys. There's the guys that investigate car crashes. But we bring it out to our scenes now and use it. And the other cool thing is it does a 3D diagram. And if more scans I can do, I start with this room in the school, you can actually move through that 3D world. And everything it touches scans. It'll be represented in there. So if you guys would sit still, like the mannequin challenge, for at least a minute and a half, it'll scan you as where you sit. And I'll know exactly measurement-wise where you were. It's far more accurate to what I am. It's 0. .00009 inches to the accuracy of it, way more than I am. So any points that I want to write, all you gotta do is click two points and it'll measure it. More. So it saves a lot of time. It's really cool. And it does, it can capture color. The laser beam knows different, uh, textures it's hitting. If it's a darker, it hits it, absorbs it a little bit more than other colors. So it figures out shades as well. Pretty cool. And the last thing I do is if I have all this evidence, I'm going to package it. And we use paper. We don't use plastic. Does anybody know why we don't use plastic? In what way? What is, what is it that might be ruining? Blood. What else is kind of important? Yeah. DNA, you're hitting on it, but what else? Yeah. What else might be on an object that I'm looking for? Fingerprints. Fingerprints. Exactly. Oh. Oh. Fingerprints, absolutely. Plastic, and I'm gonna, if I have that a gun or a hammer and I'm sliding in that plastic, it's going to, one, that, that surface of that plastic is going to rub 
the fingerprint off. That's really what I'm looking for. But also, once you seal that plastic, blood, it's biological, it's going to start degrading, it's going to turn to mildew. And uh, it's going to destroy and degrade the DNA, which I'm also looking for. We use everything's paper. We go to a scene, we have a stack of paper bags that we use, throw all our evidence in. Helps protect it. Of course, if we have bloody clothes, we're going to let it air dry before we package it. But that's really, really gets nasty and dirty. You got bloody clothes, collecting it, let it hang, then you package it. And we don't need to put like a small little hammer in a giant paper bag. We always use an accordion one. Seal it up. Make sure nobody can tamper with it. This is why we seal the edges, initial it. It's very important that we have a chain of custody with evidence. Make sure that nobody will tamper with that, because that could open up the defense if anything happens to that. And we'll use boxes, like a gun or a knife. And everything I do, if there's any DNA profiles off that I've collected, in our lab, we don't do DNA profiles. I gotta send it to our state lab, where they'll swab, check for DNA, see it with the database. Fingerprint wise, I handle everything in our office. Needles. You guys have questions about anything? Nothing? Mm -hmm. This class asks more questions than other class. Don't let me down. <laughs> So my uh, crime pool. Yeah. How long was your training? Training. Excellent. Um, I don't have any background in science.